Hi everyone, good evening. It's so great to see you here tonight. You know, thanks again for joining us for another Brockton Library Suffrage Centennial Conversation event. Tonight's about bias, all sorts of bias from institutional, systemic, and the impact of bias on services, opportunities, and achievement. It's the tendency to overestimate or underestimate the abilities of people. In light of ongoing protests for equity, this conversation will focusing on defining bias, implicit or unconscious. Uh, I want to let you know in a couple of weeks coming up on Wednesday, September 23rd, the movie will be Borderland, The Life and Times of Blanche Ames, and we'll have movie producer Kevin Friend as our special guest. I'd um, like to thank our library director and board of trustees for their support, and would like to especially thank our sponsors who have provided all of the funding for this series, the Barbara Lee Foundation and Mass Humanities. And I'd personally like to thank the Library Suffrage Planning Committee, who continues to do an absolutely phenomenal job with keeping this project alive and well. And I would like to thank Brockton Community Access for being here to Cablecast tonight's program. You can watch it on um, Brockton Cable Channel 98. Um, we're going to be especially interested in hearing your feedback about how tonight's conversation went. And Jen will put a link in the chat box in a little while to a brief online, online survey provided by Mass Humanities. Um, I'm going to introduce our moderator for the evening in a minute, but I would like to see if I can make that connection to Facebook first. Um, my name is Pat Monteith. I'm the project director for the Brockton Library Suffrage Centennial Series. Um, we've had some incredible, absolutely incredible conversations over the past uh, six or seven months, but tonight's going to be very, very special with um, our moderator for this evening, Carol Copeland Tom Thomas. And in addition to being founder of the Multicultural Symposium Series, Carol has been a speaker, trainer, global thought leader, and business owner since 1987. She moderates the discussions of key issues affecting our global marketplace. She served as an adjunct faculty member for Bentley University for a decade and has spoken throughout the United States, London, England, Canada, India, El Salvador, Australia, South Africa, and Kenya. Without further ado, live from the safe distance of her own home, um, here's Carol Copeland Thomas. Thank you, Carol. Thank you very much, Pat. It is a pleasure yeah. to be with you and your audience. Uh, thank you very much, Brockton Public Library, for discussing this important topic. If there isn't a more important topic, it's probably the coronavirus or the economy, because I look at it from a triple pandemic perspective. You're looking at the coronavirus, which kicked off January, February, and we finally found out about it and realized its seriousness in March and began to shut down by mid-March. That created economic issues. People started losing their jobs. And then we found out that frontline personnel, those uh, first responders in many cases, were people of color. So they were becoming uh, disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus. So you have the coronavirus that is disproportionately impacting black and brown people. And then we have the economy, obviously, that was intertwined with that. And then on May 25th in Minneapolis, Minnesota, George Floyd lost his life after eight minutes and 46 seconds when a police officer refused to remove his knee from his neck. And that catapulted a storm of issues, protests, debates, riots in some instances that still persist in the United States and beyond. So we have a triple pandemic that's going on. And what it's really done is that it has unearthed many of the issues that have been persistent or invisible or not discussed for many, many years. We want to talk about them tonight. We want to, first of all, talk about personal bias with our two guests. Let me just set the stage because bias is something that some people are curious about. They don't think they have bias, but they actually can have bias. And with that said, if you look at the way that you personally respond, like or dislike things, that typically is your bias. I travel quite a bit, and that's the one thing, the one sacrifice that 
I am not able to do here. And I go to India all the time. I was in India in February. And if you go to that part of the uh, uh, neck of the, the world, should I say, you know that when you get an Indian visa, you are asked specifically, do you have relatives, grandparents, parents who come from Pakistan? Because of the long time tension that's taken place between India and Pakistan. And if you're not careful because of other circumstances, you only equate Pakistan with the murder of Osama bin Laden or the execution and assassination of Benazine Bhutta, who was their prime minister, a very beautiful woman uh, in Pakistan. That may be your only association. But I am getting past that because of my own bias by watching Pakistani movies now on Netflix, since I'm home quite a bit. And they're amazingly fascinating, teaching me about the culture, along with the Indian movies that I'm watching and realizing the great similarities between the countries because they were one country before 1947. That's an example of personal bias and trying to overcome it. We have experts who want to talk to you about that. First, we have Lynn Howard. She is, I'll introduce the experts and then we will begin the discussion. Lynn Howard is the president of Delta Kappa Gamma in Massachusetts. She is also the STEM chair for AAUW, the American Association of University Women, of which I am a part, the South Shore branch. And she is a fourth grade teacher, probably going back to school now in some way, virtually or hybrid or face-to-face at the Weymouth Public Schools. We also have Pat Monteith, who is going to be uh, leading the discussion also. She is the coordinator of the Brockton Public Library Suffrage Centennial Project and a member of the Southeast Massachusetts STEM Network Advisory Board, co-chair of the NAACP AXO program, and a NASA Solar System Ambassador. Wow, that's a lot. This is going to be a great conversation I'm going to have them to start it off. Lynn, give us your perspective on personal bias, and then we'll bring Pat in the conversation. Great. And Thanks, Howard. Carol. Great. Nice to be here with everybody tonight, and as Carol said, a very important topic. Um, my focus comes mainly as an educator. When I started teaching in 1997, um, I thought back to when I was the age of my students, and I was really strong in math and science, but really had no idea what to do. Um, I didn't really think I was as good as the boys in my class. There were very few other girls in my class and didn't know what to do with, with it. My mother told me to be an engineer, but I didn't know what that even was back in the late 70s, early 80s when I was in school. So as an educator, I wanted to kind of change the look for the girls that I teach um, and work with. And I got involved with AUW along the same time. Um, been working over the last several years to help girls gain confidence and see role models so that I can help them change their bias. Because if you look at the statistics and the research that AUW has done, they're only 28% of the women, or I'm sorry, only 28% of the people in the STEM workforce are women. And then if you break it down by category, we have 48% of biological sciences, 43% of the chemists and material scientists are women. And then we get into computers and mathematical occupations and only 26% are women. And then engineers and architects, there's only 18% women. Um, so again, things have changed since I was a student, and there are more women in those careers, but we're still not there. And I think a lot of it comes to the confidence of the girls not thinking they're good enough, not have seeing role models. So a few years ago, I decided to create a STEM conference in Weymouth, and I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was like, sure, I can do this. Um, <laughs> so I got together women in STEM careers, and put, put on a half-day STEM conference. We had about 80 girls show up. They um, got to see some role models. They got to do some hands-on activities. And then since then, I've been doing it every year. I joined up with Catherine Honey, a, the STEM um, network director from the Southeast. And she and I and a few other women from AUW and some of other Ka Catherine's other contacts created a week-long STEM camp at Bridgewater State University a few years ago. It was an overnight program. I ran a similar one a year later in Weymouth, just a day program. We didn't do an overnight at the high school. <laughs> um, 
and I just have seen the change in some of these girls that I've been working with in the STEM conference. Um, they're going into careers now in STEM. They're encouraging me to keep doing it. I was really busy last year and he just said, I can't do it anymore. I can't. And one of the girls said, you have to. <laughs> and I said, okay. So I did. And, and with her help, we ran the STEM conference last year. Now, of course, COVID comes along. I'm like, what am I going to do now? So I'm pl trying and looking to planning a virtual conference. Um, because again, I've just seen the girls gain so much confidence in, in the role models. And I just think that's going to help them overcome some of the personal bias that's been kind of there underlying in education and will hopefully help close the STEM gap. Um, it's a big focus of AUW for those of you that want to get more involved in it. I encourage you to check out their website and look at the research they've done and look at the programs that they've done. So that's kind of where I come at it, but I'd be happy to talk more about it as you know, we go along through the evening. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lynn. Pat, your perspective. Pat Monteith. And you can take yourself off mute. Great. <laughs> um, my perspective actually goes back to when I went to go to college. And I wanted to work for NASA, um, which is why I'm involved with NASA now. Um, and so I figured the best way to do that, since I was good in math, was to get my undergraduate degree in math. But lo and behold, I was one of only two females who uh, wanted to become a math major. And that's something that um, always stuck with me. Um, I wasn't necessarily, uh, I don't know, looked down upon by, you know, the boys in the class, the men in the class who uh, wanted to uh, be a math major. But I felt a little bit different. And it's something, as I said, that really stuck with me over the years. Um, one of the opportunities I had about 10 years ago was to get involved in the NAACP's ACT-SO program. And it's an acronym that stands for Afro-Academic Cultural, Technological, and Scientific Olympics. Um, and it's a program specifically for African-American high school students to uh, be teamed up with mentors to help them improve whatever project that they want to perform in, that they want to compete in. There's both a local competition and a national competition. And it's in everything from the humanities to performing visual arts and STEM. And I actually personally mentor all the STEM students. Um, and one of the things that I've learned over the years is that um, there is a bias about students in STEM. And it's not just something you know, that has to do with African-American students, but as I, as I said, in my own experience um, from girls anyway. So I've been very involved through the library and the makerspace program there, but more importantly, I have been involved in the NAACP program, which is great because what happens is there are students from all over the country who participate on the national level and the national competition. There are 700 students and there is nothing um, more rewarding and satisfying as to see our students who are going to compete be able to walk into a room with 700 students that look just like them. Now, over the years, I've been very involved in the state science fair and the regional science fairs, and there have been a very low number of um, students of color who have participated in the science fair. And it's very difficult to convince the students um, to get involved in the STEM program through the APSO program uh, because they don't feel like they're going to be able to compete that there's going to be a bias against them. Mm. Uh, but once they do agree to be part of the program and they see uh, the other students, um, they feel for the first time it's a level playing field. And I can't say anything other than I agree with them completely. Yeah. So I, I want to ask both you women are uh, bold and stepping forward and certainly leading examples in terms of what women can do, what girls can do. Let me take it back to you. As a, as a teacher, we're talking about personal bias here. 
what are you seeing in your students, particularly your girl students, uh, the girls who are in your classes, in terms of, of, of their level of achievement? Does it begin to taper off in fourth grade? What are we looking at in terms of girls, I guess, between nine and 12 years old? I have a nine-year-old fourth grade granddaughter, so I sort of have uh, the ages taken care of. And I have a 12-year-old who's in the seventh grade. Lynn? Yeah. Lynn Howard. Unfortunately, I do find that it has, it does sort of taper off a little bit as they get into the middle school. And that's why I was primarily focusing my STEM conference on middle school girls, um, because I think then they start to get involved in other things, um, you know, sports and, you know, just teenage life. <laughs> and, you know, and I don't know what it is, it, but I still feel like even though it, you know, it's 30 years or more since I was in middle school, um, it's still there. And we still have to keep showing these girls role models. And, you know, when, like I said, when you look at how many people are working in the STEM fields, it's a still a low number of women in these STEM careers. And that's why I think things like the STEM conference and the things Pat's been involved in and conversations like tonight, you know, we can work together, hopefully, to show them those role models and give them the confidence. 75% um, of the women in, or 75% of the teachers are, are women. But like I said, when you look at the STEM field, you're talking less than 50% are women. Um, so I think we need to find ways to get businesses involved and encourage them to work with schools. Um, Catherine Honey's been doing a lot of that with the St Southeast STEM Network. And I think the more that businesses work with the schools, the girls will learn about some of these careers. Like I said, I didn't know what an engineer was when I was in high school. And I think there's still girls today that probably don't even know what it is. You know, even though we've increased the number that are going into engineering and some of the other fields. Um, I think the schools need to work more on making it a priority. A lot of schools have, but I think we can still do even more um, with making sure computer programming is being taught, making sure we're doing STEM classes and showing them careers and things like that. Um, the, the governor of our state has taken a big step toward that last year when he instituted STEM week. Um, we're still trying to do something with it this year, even with COVID and, you know, play and schools not in normal session, but all of this, I think we just need to all work together to help educate the girls. It can't just be, you know, the little bit that they get in the school time. It's got to be all of us working together as a community, the businesses, the, you know, the educators, making sure that it becomes a priority um, so that they get involved in, in that and they can see past the bias that they might have because all they've seen are women in other careers, sure. you know, and so that's Great. kind of... Well, we're, we're going, to, uh, there's so much we could, sh we could talk about you being an educator and a teacher. We're going to definitely uh, pull you back in the conversation shortly. I just quickly want to bring uh, Pat Monteith back on. Uh, do you have anything specifically that is of concern re uh, regarding uh, the pandemic and how students, you work with the NAACP AXO program, a wonderful program uh, that uh, is to be admired. Do, do you, and, and sadly, the NAACP convention, national convention, those of you who are watching elsewhere, was going to be in Boston. Boston was the host branch. And because of COVID, uh, it was done virtually and uh, at a much reduced uh, level. So certainly the NAACP is near and dear to all of our hearts in this area. Any thoughts in particular as it relates to COVID-19 and personal bias? Pat Monteith. Well, actually, I think that COVID-19 has opened up the opportunities uh, for girls in particular. Um, I've seen more girls get involved in a lot of the programs and projects that I'm working with, and it's great to be able to see them on the screen. Um, it's great to have seen them at the National uh, AXO competition. Um, there were, I believe there were many more girls than boys this year. Um, and I don't know if it's because they don't feel like they have to compete in the same room. Mm. Um, but it, it does uh, bring up a lot of questions. And mm. I think there's a lot of hope in the future to see that we might be able to do more of this and get more girls involved in particular. Mm. Well, I'm sure we will have many more months to discuss this because as far as I know, I don't think there's going to be an actual vaccine distributed to 7 billion people 
anytime before 2021. So we're going to be Zooming it. We're going to be dealing with a lot of these issues for quite some time. But I like the spirit that, Pat, you're saying that it, it's opened up new opportunities. And that is encouraging for all of us. So I do thank you, uh, Pat Monteith and Lynn uh, Howard. They'll be back a little bit later on. We're going to move on and talk about the institutional component of bias. And I want to give a personal shout out and thanks to Catherine Honey. Because about 10 years ago, I was either moderating or speaking at one of her STEM uh, conferences in, I believe, Attleboro. Must have been about that length of time. She's shaking her head. So, yeah, the time period is correct. And I didn't know much about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. I know a lot about it now, but I want to thank Catherine Honey for the stalwart job that she's been doing all these years to really expose our girls in particular and boys to the important topic of of the evening. Now, let's move on and let's talk about institutional bias. Um, We're going to look at it and uh, sort of define it in terms of moving from an individual and the choices that they may make or the choices that they don't make or what they avoid or how they feel about people or cultures, et cetera, to how it becomes scaled up to an organizational level to actual institutions. And with this conversation, we're going to talk with, I will introduce them at first, and then they will begin the conversation. Keith Connors, he is the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education Uh, Program Manager and STEM Pipeline Fund and Program Director. He is also the Academic Affairs and Student Success along with the STEM Pipeline Fund. And his focus, Equity Agenda, supported by the Higher Education uh, Innovation uh, Fund, 100 Males to College, and Massachusetts STEM Network efforts to ensure equitable services for all students in all communities. We also are going to be joined in conversation with Dr. Sabrina Gentle Warrior. She is the Vice President of Division of Student Success and Diversity at Bridgewater State University. Also a part of Focus 100 Males to College at Bridgewater State University and a leading leading for change higher education diversity consortium. Um, We'd like to have them to first of all define and give us a sense of of this word institutional uh, bias. We're also hearing it in terms of institutional racism as we're talking about these conversations or they're sort of used as bookends or together. And uh, uh, Keith Connors, start us off with a conversation about your perspective of institutional bias and what are some ways to, to deal with it and manage it. Keith Connors. Sure, thank you so much, Carol. I really appreciate the opportunity to do so. Um, At the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education, you know, we're we're cognizant that um, American institutions of higher education were actually founded on a system built for advancing education and aspiration for white males. And this, this system provided men with a solid primary and secondary education for uh, making them college ready. Um, But this institution really hasn't moved and changed uh, to meet the, the, the complexity of, of a very diverse society that we have now. Um, our institution was looking at itself in these ways and how are we perpetuating that both conscious and unconscious bias. And we saw very much in our, our policies and our uh, protocols that in fact, there are many ways that um, such biases and racial, racial inequities are perpetuated So with the vision of our our board chair and our our commissioner, we identified as the number one priority for Massachusetts higher education to be equity. And within that, we we created the equity agenda. And that equity agenda um, has identified um, a number of principles and then action steps. And I'll just mention a few to give you a sense of the deep work that is occurring in in the agency. And I, and I want to start off by saying that we as staff, every staff member from the commissioner on down to the newest employee went through intensive training offered by the University of Southern California's, I don't have it uh, right in front of me, um, uh, Race and Equity Center to really, um, to really open our eyes to our own personal biases and unconscious biases. 
so that as we're approaching this work, we're approaches, approaches, approaching it in, a, in the right framework and through that equity lens. <clears throat> um, so in terms of those, those action steps, there were really five. One was a policy audit. I'm actually involved with that team. So we broke out the staff into teams. The policy audit is looking at um, all aspects of our policy that might in fact not be advancing our goals around equity and that being an inhibitor to those aspirations. Um, so that would include the examination of policies and, and initiatives that result and result in the rescinding or modification of policies that create or exacerbate racial in, inequity. Um, really exciting work. Um, we'll be doing that over a three-year period. And actually, each, um, each employee that oversees a certain aspect of our work, from finance to, um, to programming to, to direct policy work, will be engaged in this kind of effort. We're also looking at the undergraduate student experience. And uh, that's actually a document that was written, I think, in 1989 that hasn't been revisited. So what is that experience to... Um, that young black and brown uh, student that's coming onto campus that doesn't see others like them and what opportunities are there for them to feel fully part of the fabric of that campus. Um, so we're looking at all aspects of that. Another step is um, uh, looking at a community of practice that, uh, that we're working very closely with our campus partners. So, uh, Dr. Sabrina Gentle Warrior is on, on this uh, event with us and she'll be speaking more deeply to those aspects of it. And then, of course, you want to really sustain this effort. So we've, we received a, a substantial um, gift from the Lumina Foundation. In fact, there was a, a launch of the equity agenda um, this morning. We had our Secretary Elizabeth Warren on, uh, Representative Ayanna Presley, our Commissioner, the Secretary of Education, and others, um, showing that there is, is a community wrapping around the importance of this work that the department has initiated. Awesome. Very good. Uh, tag teaming is, uh, is Dr. Sabrina, Gentle Warrior. Will you continue the conversation and talk about it clearly from a Bridgewater State University perspective, this whole concept of institutional bias? Dr. Uh, Gentle Warrior. Please call me Sabrina and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I deeply appreciate everybody's work represented on the call and in the listeners. It's going to take all of us to get this done. Uh, Keith has done an extraordinary job laying out uh, extraordinary leadership of Commissioner Santiago and his staff across the Commonwealth, as well as the truth that needs to be absolutely faced, which is rather than being shining cities on the hill, too often and typically our institutions of higher education, as well as our K-12 systems, are not equitably serving our black and brown students. Now, typically that is not because of explicit racism on behalf of most of these institutions. It is because systemic racism in the whole society the way in which whiteness is glorified and privileged at the vast disadvantage and dangerous disadvantage of black and brown individuals has created a system in which the pipeline from K to 12, as well as our higher education institutions, our black and brown students are simply not succeeding at the same rates. And that is not for lack of talent, capacity, will, joyful collaboration of the families. It is because of racism at the individual level, the institutional level, and the systemic level. Because of the leadership of folks like Commissioner Santiago, here in Massachusetts, we're saying enough. We're saying Massachusetts wants to help lead the nation in ensuring that every student has an equal chance for success. At Bridgewater State University, the entirety of President Clark's presidency has been summarized by him as supporting the success of every student, one student at, the, at a time. We have a obligation at Bridgewater and in every educational institution, I believe, 
to look at ourselves and ensure that we are truly prepared to serve the students who are coming to us. I think the listeners, as well as my co-presenters here on this call, understand that by 2042 or sooner, this region will have more black and brown students than white students. And the fact that when you look at our metrics in the federal IPEDS data for higher education, you see that almost without exception across the nation, for those campuses that are still predominantly white, still populated largely by predominantly white students, we have an equity gap in our student outcomes. At Bridgewater State University, under the leadership of President Clark, we have said we want to lead in our type of institution for eliminating opportunity gaps for our black and brown students. But we can't do that alone. We need everybody's good ideas. We need everybody's efforts. So in 2014, Bridgewater convened and began to coordinate something called the Leading for Change Diversity Consortium. Initially, for the first couple of years, we focused on all equity gaps. And then we decided to focus specifically on racial education, racial educational um, equity outcomes. So we are now entering our third year with 25 campuses working together. And if you are a member of a higher ed institution and you want to learn how your institution can join free of charge, get a hold of me and we'll make that happen. But we have 25 campus teams that are working together, public institutions, private institutions, to your community colleges, for your public's elite privates, working together in a curriculum where we are month after month identifying what are our educational equity gaps, why are they existing, and what are interventions that we can do to remediate those equity gaps, and typically that means changing ourselves. Hmm. Looking at what we need to do at an institutional level to truly create campuses that our black and brown students and their families deserve. Hmm. This is so very possible because of conversations like this, because of coordinated efforts, and this is the work that we need to do. The nation is at an inflection point where white America is finally paying attention. I'm grateful for that, and I'm grateful for our coordinated efforts for racial equity and justice. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. You, you bring up so many great points along with Keith. We, we first started off our conversation with both uh, Pat and Lynn talking about mostly younger children and what's being done with the programs like the NAACP AXO program, STEM program that is uh, hitting middle school, et cetera. And now we're up to the university level. Question to both of you. This is not a political program, but I have to address the elephant in the room. And the latest elephant in the room is a, an edict that came down from the White House last week banning diversity training programs on the federal level with federal agencies. I don't know how it's going to be done. But I certainly have friends. I've been in diversity for 33 years, in part because of AAUW. I got some of my early training when I was with another branch and, and learned and cut my teeth on diversity because of AAUW, going to Washington, D.C., and then working with several branches. So I know the training is important, and it certainly is one that is so necessary with all that all speakers are talking about, yet we have this ban that is taking place on the, on the federal level that can have a ripple down effect uh, with institutions uh, that we're talking about, nonprofit and otherwise. Just a quick comment, uh, Keith, and any thoughts about that? Um, it's a revelation and, and a shocking one, um, and maybe it shouldn't be shocking. Um, initial thought around that is I'm so grateful for the leadership of Commissioner Santiago, our board, and our administration here in Massachusetts who really do care about these issues and that I, I feel supported um, as, a, uh, as, as part of the staff of the Department of Higher Education in that I know that there will be funding found to, to push forward this mission of, of ensuring uh, racial equity inclusion um, across across the Commonwealth. So I didn't I did not know about that. It's shameful, um, but I'm glad we're in a state that elevates uh, this issue and understands the importance of it, not for just our institutions, um, 
but for all of us, uh, for a greater prosperity and better lives um, for everyone. So um, I, I clearly need to keep up with, with current news and I'm a poli-sci person and I'm all over that stuff. So thanks, Carol. Yeah, I, I checked it out. It was a Forbes article. NPR has picked it up. And uh, yeah, uh, Sabrina? <laughs> so I was beginning my first cup of coffee this Saturday morning, beginning of a long weekend. And I will admit it here in front of all of you as part of my moral community, one of my favorite times of the day is my first sip of coffee. And it got utterly destroyed by that news story. Now, I, I wrote a number of my friends and I said, I'm simultaneously outraged and delighted by this. And I wrote, the outrage is evident. Let me share my delight. When we know we are making inroads for justice, for equity, for a change, there is always a pushback. So for a pushback to be happening at that level around this issue means that the movement that is gaining momentum in recent months for very tragic and very preventable reasons is taking hold in the consciousness of white America in a way that perhaps it hasn't since the civil rights movement. Mm. So while I am utterly outraged, I think the fact that something like anti-racist training is getting that level of attention shows just how powerful our combined work is. And what I would say along, I'm sure with all of my co-presenters, is keep agitating, activating, educating. And while I will not make any political statement on who to vote for in this setting, vote. Nuff said, mic drop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great segue into our next piece talking about systemic bias. And before we do that, two things. Number one, I'm sure if you're watching this program live, listening live, whether you're in our Zoom room or whether you are one of our Facebook audience participants, we want to hear from you. So we'd love for you to put your question in the comments box whether it's here on Zoom or whether it is with your Facebook comments box. Now, they, they will get to me, and we will do our best to answer the questions during our fourth segment. Number two, there is a document that is being drafted with many resources. Catherine, honey, you talk about resourceful and thorough. She is that. So she is putting together a comprehensive resource list we will be getting that to you, I believe, after the program based on the uh, contact information that we have uh, for those of you who are here um, in the room. And it will also be made available to the Brockton Public Library if you are listening after the fact. Pat Monteith, her staff, her team will have it available, I'm sure, somewhere on the website. So stay tuned for that. We're talking about these issues, and it does warrant some research afterward, so you will have the opportunity to do that with the resource list that is being generated. We definitely want to have your questions, and I just threw a sort of a curveball to our attendees who answered it masterfully, so that's the time that we're in. This is not play. This is not something that is um, soft. These are very, very important issues that relate to all of us. So we move up, we talk about institutional bias, and now we're going to move up to systemic bias. And systemic bias becomes the whole concept of policy and how d uh, diversity and bias and the discriminatory issues become sort of baked in the cake. Um, with that said, I'll give you an example. And there, Catherine Honey, she is on the point. She actually has dropped in the chat box the actual bias resource list. So you can click on that, as I'm going to do right now, and it will download into your device. So you can click on it. It will download into the device, and then you will have that list. And obviously, if you are listening after the fact, you can check with the Brockton Public Library. They will also be able to access and give you the resource list that has been prepared for you. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the United States States Constitution. I, I'm a diversity trainer and professional. I've been doing this 33 years, and I can pretty much cite that part of the Constitution, which, be, be, which began in our country the systemic 
action of racism that permanently defined the value of people. It, it dealt with um, uh, three-fifths of a person, all other persons. <clears throat> it talked about slaves being three-fifths of a person and what that meant from an economic perspective. It was a compromise between the new southern states and the new northern states right after the Revolutionary War. It also talked about Indians, indigenous people, Native Americans, who were not counted at all and did not become American citizens until 1924. It also defined women, white women, because they weren't quite at the top, 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 because they couldn't own land and vote. Men, only white men, could own land and vote. And then the indigenous, or at least the um, interim people, indentured servants, I call them America's temporary workforce. They came over largely from parts of Europe. They may have been broke, destitute, in jail, prostitutes, whatever, starting over again. They were in bondage for seven years. They paid that bondage off, paid themselves to become free people, and then they moved up into society. So you have these casts of people that created what we now know as the United States and systematized how we value people in this country. So with that said, we're talking about systemic bias, and we want to talk now with Dr. Amina Pilgrim. She is the senior lecturer in women's gender and sexuality studies and critical ethic, ethnic and community studies, uh, College of Liberal Arts, UMass Boston. She's also a library trustee and a mom. So she will uh, start that conversation. And then we have Willie Wilson Jr. He is the co-founder and co-chair of Racial Reconciliation Task Force for the Brockton Assembly of God. He's also a history scholar. Uh, He is part of the Brockton Public Library Suffragette Centennial Project, uh, the English language instructor for Upward Bound and an adjunct history professor at Stonehill College. He has a wonderful young student who he is also going to introduce very shortly. We're going to begin the conversation, first of all, with Amina, Amina Pilgrim, Dr. Amina Pilgrim. What about the systemic bias? Thank you so much, Carol. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here with everyone this evening. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely, you're fine. <laughs> All right, great. Well, I wanted to uh, begin with coming back to what uh, my previous co-presenters, uh, Keith and Sabrina mentioned in terms of higher ed. Um, when we talk about systemic bias and policy, I think that folks tend to lose sight of Uh, the smaller pieces that make up um, the broader issue. And so I think a lot about education as both a mom and as uh, a professor. Um, And I want to ask everyone to think about the way that systemic bias shows up in uh, the system of education, if you will, because it connects to every facet of, of our lives. And um, it shows up in in access, as we just heard. It shows up in admissions practices. It shows up in mentoring and teaching. It shows up in in grading, in the choices that educators make about the resources and the, the, the text to assign or to leave out. It also shows up in faculty hiring. Um, the hiring of K-12 teachers or paraprofessionals and other staff. It shows up in issues around pay equity. And obviously it shows up in tenure and promotion. And with COVID-19 forcing everyone, almost everyone to go remote, um, it's brought light um, to the fact that it shows up in the digital divide. Um, As much access as we have at this moment, where we're having the greatest access to information ever in human history, there are still uh, many, many people who are left out because of the digital divide. So all of these things uh, combine to create systemic um, bias or systemic 
racism. And then this bias gets internalized, right? Um, so that if you're a child in a classroom where a teacher is not aware of their unconscious bias and you're uh, full of talent and, and, and wisdom or knowledge and you're um, as bright as can be, but your skin is black or brown, maybe you're never called on, right? Um, and then maybe you internalize that, that something's inferior about you. Right. I myself was asked by a teacher in my, I think, fifth grade class um, if I if I cheated on my work because mm -hmm. I, I tended to get um, high grades. And the teacher actually said to me, um, your people don't get these type of grades. Right. Wow. And I'll never forget that it stays with me um, until today. And it informs my own teaching practice um, where I try to be a different kind of teacher and to show up differently in the classroom. Um, but one of the things that, um, one of the bright spots, one of the places of hope is that there are programs within ethnic studies, um, women's and gender and sexuality studies that sort of work to provide an antidote uh, to systemic bias. And they, these programs have grown out of the very struggle, the, the civil rights struggle, the black power struggle um, that have led us to this moment. And these programs are meant to speak truth to power. Um, they were meant to restore humanity to those folks that the three-fifths clause um, denied humanity to. And they're really designed to dismantle um, systemic bias and to challenge it at every turn. Um, there's a lot of work being done right now to decolonize uh, curricula and to um, decolonize teaching practices. Um, this summer, I, I had the honor of working alongside um, Professor Willie Wilson, who you'll hear from in a moment. And, um, we did some work to educate folks in Brockton around Black history. Um, but I've been fortunate to have so many great allies and, and friends in the city of Brockton um, that also contribute to this work. Um, I see Janet Trask here. I see Chris Ajemian, who I know is also going to speak. Yes. And um, I think it's just important to leave on an optimistic note that, like Sabrina said, um, if we all do our part, you know, we can chip away at this thing. And this is our time to do so. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Hmm. Well, you, you brought up so many great points, Amina. Uh, one of them, going back to your own childhood, I've heard this before. You are a bright and gifted child. My, I think about my 12-year-old granddaughter, who is now taking honors math and honors English. And one teacher could have turned you around questioning the work that you turned in just because of her concept of systemic uh, values of a particular ethnic group, yet it did not stop you and you moved forward. Hats off to you for your courage and wisdom despite someone else's limitations. Again, we'd love to have your questions in the chat room, whether it's on Facebook or whether it is in the Zoom chat room. I do want to introduce and bring her on right now, Chris Ajamian, and she is the president of my branch, president of the AAUW American Association of University Women Taunton Area Branch. She is also a member of the Borderland Suffragette uh, Planning Committee, and her focus uh, in terms of AAUW, which I think everybody should know, is that the mission is to advance gender equality for women and girls through research, education, and advocacy. And the programs that I have attended are so stimulating. I am probably the only African American in my branch. Most of the other women are uh, white, older white, but boy, do they pull together great programs, bringing together the best and the brightest, like Amina to our meetings to teach and educate us, not just about what's taking place here in the United States, but what's happening back in Egypt and other parts of the world where they come from. So Chris and Jamie, come on up and, and talk to us about systemic bias. Um, yes, there is a lot 
to be said about systemic bias. And I, I have to say that my relationship with Amina goes back maybe 20 years, Amina, 15, 20 years, when she was <laughs> a, an adjunct professor at Massasoit. Um, and we worked together on, on several uh, initiatives involving the Cape Verde and young students that uh, um, forming that community, that academic community, and, and supporting that. So it's wonderful to see her now a full-fledged professor at UMass Boston. So it's wonderful to, to see that, and I congratulate her and as a leader in her community uh, in many, many ways. Um, thank you, Carol, for the plug for AAUW. We are delighted to have you in our branch, and, and uh, you're a wonderful asset. Um, we are older, but we hope to, you know, we like to consider ourselves as learners all the time, as people who are um, learning as much as we can throughout all of our lives. Mm -hmm. Learning doesn't stop once you hit your 60s or 70s. And uh, it's, I think Willie might agree with that, no? Uh, and <laughs> so um, what does AUW do, or how, what has AUW done to fight systemic bias against women uh, in education and higher education? During this whole celebration of the 100th uh, anniversary of suffrage, we've seen many, many examples of how women were pushed aside and kept back and, um, and the struggles that they had to overcome, both black and white women, it's, it's they, that they faced during the abolition and suffrage movements. Nevertheless, women kept trying to attend college and, and universities and slowly moved into the professions. These were mostly white women uh, from middle class and upper class homes whose family supported their education. Um, but in, uh, pr progress was made among um, the black communities too. Uh, and as these graduates moved out of their, um, out into the world of work, they started facing bias and obstacles um, in, for themselves and um, saw that they had to do something. So in 1881, in Boston, a small group of college graduates formed the American Association, what became eventually the American Association of University Women, AAUW to support other women's pursuit of education, because they knew that for changes to be made, for there to be changes in policy in that system, that women had to be there, had to be at the table. They had to become professors so that there, as teaching would change and there would be more acceptance for, of, for women in those classrooms um, at the higher education level, and eventually make much more, um, much more um, long-lasting change as presidents of colleges and universities. So to foster this, women needed, uh, to make this possible, women needed graduate degrees. So in 1888, uh, AUW, since 1888, AUW has given more than $100 million to women to finish their PhDs to do research. And last year, um, AUW gave $3.5 million to grants to American and international students. They range from about $2,000 for small projects to, 30, to 35,000 uh, for women in their final year of PhD, um, a PhD program. For international students in particular, Carol mentioned that we meet through our AOW programs, we meet students from around the world, from Egypt, from um, Kenya, um, one in particular that we saw, we met last year. For them, it's a life-changing opportunity to be able to come here to the United States, to go to a Harvard, to go to a BU, um, it, because there's, we have so many wonderful schools in our area, and to have this, this financial support where they can finish their PhD, and then they go home to their country and take their knowledge and their experience with them and make wonderful changes there. Um, the one woman from Kenya that came to my mind in particular was um, working on public health, Harvard School of Public Health, so that she could go home to Kenya and with her mother establish a maternity hospital where um, in the ghetto, the part, ghetto part of the city where they lived, um, her mother was a midwife, but they needed, they, she wanted to do something much more um, permanent and substantial. So with this degree, uh, giving her the, the, um, the credentials and the ability to say to her government, here I am with this Harvard degree, let's do this. So it, 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 AUW, I think, has made huge impacts on, around the world. Um, there have been a wonderful, um, Fellowships granted, money granted to women through the history. The first one was 1920, Madame Curie, Marie Curie. She needed $100,000 to buy one gram of uranium. And um, AUW raised 56,000 of that dollar, half of her amount. That's in 1920. Uh, who knows what that value would be today? Probably in the millions. Um, in the 1960s, a civil rights movement was happening and AUW raised $130,000 to establish a fellowship 
uh, in honor of Coretta Scott King, which would fund the study of peace, nonviolence, and African-American studies. Um, the first recipient, there's a wonderful picture of Coretta Scott King, the president of AUW, and the first recipient who was Dr. Nell Painter, uh, who went on to be a, an historian and a scholar at Princeton and had wrote, uh, is the author of several books, and her latest is The History of White People. That's interesting. Um, another recipient was um, the second woman chosen for the NASA, women's second woman chosen for NASA's astronaut program, Judith Resnick. Um, and Judith unfortunately died on board the Challenger with teacher Krista McAuliffe in 1986, if you remember. Um, and that was a tragic and huge loss. But there is a Judith Resnick Fellowship um, to support women's scholarship in the, in the sciences. Mae Jemison, the first black female astronaut, is an AAUW awardee. Um, and the Washington branch of a Washington DC branch of AAUW gives a scholarship in honor of Mary Church Terrell, whom we know as a suffragist and a black human rights activist. Uh, we learned about Mary Church Terrell and, and along with many other um, African-American uh, suffragists through the programs that we've been able to attend here at the Brockton Public Library. And uh, Willie Wilson has been involved in that and we'll, we'll maybe hear some more about that. Another, closer to home, another fellow is Rachel Robbins. Rachel Robbins received a fellowship uh, to study law and she's the first woman elected to um, district attorney in Boston and is making certainly, uh, she's a strong voice and, and working for change in, in the criminal justice system in Massachusetts, especially as it pertains to that whole school to pipes to jail pipeline that affects so many of our, our young African uh, men. Um, and um, another one is the um, uh, Melissa, the uh, news commentator, Melissa Harris Perry, she was a 2001-2002 fellow. So impact of AUW in, in fellowships, supporting women in their, their uh, journey along higher education to, again, break through those barriers in the system, trying to, um, to get into where things happen and, and change is made in the higher levels uh, through, through the, these, their studies and their credentials. Another area is the research. And Lynn mentioned already some of the research that AUW has done on, um, especially in, in the reaction of, of against bias and, uh, and prejudice in, in, um, in the STEM fields. And the, the information for that is on that sheet that, that Catherine has, has ready for you. And the studies that they've done show that while women represent more than 50% of graduates from colleges and universities, they're not well represented, as Lynn gave you the statistics, in, um, in professorships, even still today, uh, as college presidents in industry or even in research labs. And even though young women are, are taking um, higher level math courses in high school and college and are graduating with degrees in STEM in greater numbers, women still find resistance once they get into their careers. Uh, into college at the university level and even more when they get into their careers. Their talents are sometimes underutilized, ignored, or underrated. And um, their scholarship is, is scrutinized more closely um, with the idea that they, as uh, Amina gave the example, they couldn't really be doing this kind of work because after all, they're women um, and what do they know? So many women leave the field uh, reporting uh, that they feel um, they're in a hostile or unfriendly working environment. So we're losing those talented uh, women who've made that supreme effort of getting into those areas, and it's really unfortunate. Another thing the research uncovered, AUW research, was what they called the mother penalty. That once a woman has a child, her commitment to her job is questioned. There's no such penalty for the fathers. <laughs> and uh, the same issues that women faced in the 60s and 70s, uh, in addition to the racism and all of that, they're still struggling with to, with all those things that COVID brought out and put right in front of our faces, childcare, um, the balance of home and work, and pay equity. All of those things uh, came out in the research as being barriers, systemic barriers supported by um, all of those systems that women go through uh, to uh, get to where they wanna get, that those things are still there and holding them back. To change, to make change, um, I think we need to to make change in ourselves with our own implicit bias, even those of us who, who I took that little Harvard uh, bias test. Implicit, that awesome. Yes, that, that, that anybody can take online. It's, it's free of charge, absolutely. Well, guess what? I came up as being biased against women in science. 
<laughs> I'm embarrassed to say, but the, you know, the, all the things that immediately, your first reaction, uh, and it showed that I still have these biases in my, in deep inside. So we need to work on ourselves. <laughs> And uh, we need to continue to support women and girls in the pursuit of their dreams. We need more women role models. Lynn is working hard on, on making that, sure that that happens, or at least finding those ways to happen, as is, as is Catherine. Uh, and um, we need to help girls with their confidence. One of the things that this research shows is that girls' confidence is fragile, and all they need is a setback. Like I mean, mentioned, just a little bit of a setback, and they're, I can't do this, I'm not good at this, I'm not smart enough. I'm not as smart as the boys. This is not for me. So we need to kind of change that, that pathway, that, that loop that, that girls and women get onto. We need to, another thing that the research showed was that we need mentors, supportive mentors in colleges and universities, Sabrina and Keith. We need them there. And, and Amina, you're doing that already, to um, draw them in, support them, give them the confidence that they need, and guide them. And finally, there has to be a commitment from the top uh, to increase the numbers of women in leadership roles in institutions, the tops of institutions, the tops of industry, and the tops of education. The leaders of all those places need to have a concerted, definite effort, similar to the one that Keith and Sabrina was describing, to really make sure that, um, that we work at these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, wow. You gave us a mouthful, the, the history of AAUW, the money that they have actually used to fund women who we know now in modern life, including those historic figures like Madame uh, Curie, who, uh, again, has just gone down in history in terms of her work in science and mm -hmm. half of the money that she needed for one gram of uranium being raised by AAUW. My reason for staying in this organization, and I'll always be a part of this organization, I have to give credit to my aunt, the late Camilla Thomas, uh -huh. who was my great aunt, a teacher in Columbus, Georgia, where my family hails from, and she was uh, probably the first member, black member of her local branch. And I remember going to one of her meetings when I was in college. It stuck with me the importance, the significance of, of that group and the significance of the branches all over the system. So thank you for that very comprehensive look at AAUW. We're going to move ahead now and bring on Willie Wilson Jr. and his very special guest. Willie, take it away. First of all, Carol, I want to thank you uh, and thank all of my co-participants. Um, but first, I have to mention that um, the AAUW just doesn't encourage and do things for women. Uh, as a freshman at Boston College, I was awarded a special award by the Andover branch and it so touched me and motivated me. I, I did my junior year abroad at the Center for African Studies in Birmingham, England. But that, that branch invited me to Andover. I received an award and, uh, for my work in, in, as an undergraduate in, uh, in African American Studies and being, uh, pay, playing a leadership role in, uh, in the Black Student Union. And it, it, was, it was just so moving and that the organization, so I don't want, as, as our listeners are participating, I don't want them to think that the work is strictly and totally focused on women because it's about making America a better place in general. And there are, there is recognition and awardees uh, and awards for, uh, for men as well. But uh, I do want to talk about um, uh, my particular role in this outstanding centennial celebration of uh, the 19th Amendment. And when we began, we started with about uh, 70 uh, black suffragettes. And then the number increased as we did research to 150. Uh, and then uh, working with the online biographical dictionary uh, uh, program of women um, in Virginia, it increased to uh, 200. And uh, as of last week, uh, it was uh, 387 women 
uh, of color who have not been noted historically ever before. So it's been an exciting, uh, an exciting uh, journey, my participation in this. And since Mary Church Terrell, who is in my African American course, she's always featured properly, uh, but uh, she was the founder in 1892. Uh, the co-founder of the Colored Women's League in Washington, D.C. And that same year, 1892, the Federation of Afro-American Women was established in Boston by Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin. And the reason why I mention that is because this month in Brookline, the Coolidge Corner School will be renamed the Florida Ruffin Ridley School, who is one of our Black suffragists, and, uh, and she's one of those 387. So that's happening this month. And, uh, and you can see the connections. And it's just uh, wonderful. As you probably know, Florida Ruffin Ridley, uh, with her and her husband were uh, one of the first African, if not the first African res African American residents to the town of Brookline. So this is such a, a, a wonderful year. All these things are happening. And um, and I'm just glad about the research. And again, working with uh, Amina Pilgrim in this wonderful five-part uh, series that we did for uh, Citizens of Brockton on African-American history. Uh, and it was, it was just exciting. And, uh, and uh, so I'm just glad to be here. Now, in that, uh, in, that, in that vein, I'd like to mention also, we have, uh, uh, I, I also teach English in the Upward Bound program. And in the Upward Bound program, my role is, is really getting materials that are by Haitian writers, African writers, Cape Verdean writers, so students can see men and women who've written in some of their home cultures. And, uh, and so it, we still do all the necessary grammar work and punctuation and, and so forth, but just so to get firsthand primary source materials uh, of writers who are non-white. Uh, and, uh, and so that's one of the roles that I have. And the woman that, the young high school woman that I'm going to introduce to you uh, wrote uh, a poem and the poem is so uh, uh, poignant and, and moving. And the first time I heard it, her name is Melody Rivas and she's going to recite her poem in a few minutes. Um, it, it, it's just very moving. And, and she picks up in her poem, she picks up around the year 1920. But what I want to say is even the thousands of women before 1920 who have literally put their lives on the line for rights, voting rights, equality in terms of being in, ter in terms of treatment and other things. So um, with that said, I don't want to take any more time. And I would like to introduce Melody Revis. Melody, you can take yourself off mute. My bad, sorry. So I am Melody. Um, as Mr. Wilson said, I did write a poem about the suffrage movement. Um, this is inspired strangely by a post I saw online. It was simply about how Asian American women had not secured the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. And I thought that was strange because I thought the 19th Amendment was for all women. But then I looked it up and I did a, f and I did a little bit of research and it turns out that pretty much only white women were allowed to vote when the 19th Amendment was passed. And um, many Native Americans and Hispanics and Blacks were barred from voting for a very long time until the Voting Rights Act was passed in 65. And so I thought this would be um, a wonderful opportunity to talk about it and educate people on it. So without further ado, here is my poem. The war was not won in 1920, yet there were still white women aplenty, dropping their signs, leaving the streets, raising their voices to whoop with glee, drowning out the frantic colored cries of, what about me? 
The war was not won in 1930. Many women were left still yearning to vote right next to their fair-skinned peers to get what they had been denied for years. Their voices were silenced, their ballots were empty, but they did not stop in 1920. The war was not won in 1950, but there was no time to waste on pity. American women from all shades of life, natives, Hispanics, and blacks alike, never stopped making and painting their signs, never stopped fighting to gain voting rights. And when met with a pale opposing crowd, they raised their voices twice as loud. Nothing would stop them, not even their fear. They continued their fight right up to the year of 1965, when a fateful rally was planned to march the highway from Selma to a piece of Montgomery land. Though their protest was peaceful, bloody Sunday still did raise, and by state troopers meant to protect, they were beaten, gassed, and tased. But despite the attacks, the protesters would not be scared away. They continued their highway march to span all of three days. And through this injustice, they fought back and were paid off with the Voting Rights Act. The war was won in August of 1965, when colored women across the nation were able to set down their signs, when they stepped off the streets and to the polling place formed lines, when they stood together and said, the right to vote is mine. Thank you. Wow. (laughs) Wow. That was fantastic. Melanie, I'm going to ask you, do you give us permission to uh, share your poem online, giving you full credit. Is that okay? Yes, that would be lovely, actually. I want to share this. I, I particularly want people to know the significance and the importance of voting and particularly what it took for women of color to vote. Uh, what it took, I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, and our women were marching in 1913 They didn't want us to march, but we marched because of the suffragette movement. I actually reenacted that with thousands of other women in in, in 2013, the 100th anniversary. So your poem just really brings it all home. And isn't it interesting, everyone, that we started off talking about personal bias and elevating young people and young women. And then we end this portion of our program with a beautiful young woman who has written this magnificent poem. Uh, Willie Wilson, thank you so much for introducing Melanie to us. Very talented young woman to just let you know it. I'm excited about what we have here uh, in terms of our country. So again, thank you very, very much. We're going to bring everybody back on, uh, I say probably for about another 10 minutes, 10 minutes, if that's okay. Would like to answer any questions that you have with our panel. We've talked about personal bias. We've talked about uh, institutional bias. We've now talked about systemic bias, and we've had a very, very courageous young woman to uh, lift everybody up in terms of the significance of voting, etc. One thing I want to remind everybody, and I'll put that in the chat room, is that you have between now and September 30th to turn in your census. So please, please, please turn in your census for your home between now and and the 30th of September. Why? Because money, allocations, resources, etc., that come from the federal government are all based on the census and also redistricting, which will take place after the census. It is so, so very important. So let's open it up for questions, but I first want to ask, Melanie, how old are you? I am 15 years old. I'm going <laughs> into sophomore year. Sophomore year in high school. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Great. Great. All right. Let's uh, have, if you don't have questions that you put in the chat room, I'm going to be bold and courageous and say, if you are here in the Zoom room, take yourself off mute and ask your question. Any questions at all? I'm sure we have a couple. And this can also come from our panelists as well. Yeah, I'll I'll jump in. Okay, uh, go ahead, Pat. Um, You know, when Chris was talking about, you know, helping girls and women have the confidence to do things, um, it's a slow process and sometimes we forget. 
You know, when we have somebody like Melody, who's only 15 years old, um, I'm sure she was really scared when she first came on um, a couple of weeks ago um, at one of the other events. But, you know, it's okay to fail. It's okay to be, you know, upset about something or not have the confidence. And that's one of the roles I think I play and probably play best with the students that I mentor is I see my job as helping give these kids the confidence to be able to get out there and succeed. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And even if they fail, they've succeeded just by trying. Yeah, awesome. I, I, I wanted to also say uh, again on that same vein, uh, in the Upward Bound program, our uh, administrator at Brockton High, Alicia Sly, she uh, started uh, a, a STEM component to the program. And I was amazed at, um, at the work because I only have these students uh, in English. And, uh, and I was amazed at the projects they did. And, uh, and now that's a permanent component um, uh, to Upward Bound. Uh, with the STEM component in it. Uh, again, it's just, uh, it was wonderful. And the, and the students, after they completed, they did something in robotics and they did another project. And, uh, and, and what I, as a teacher, both high school and college, it, it's, it's just uh, when students surpass your expectations, even though I have great expectations, and I just love that feeling. And the, Melanie only being 15 years old to encapsulate those, you know, I think of all those women, and that's a point. That's why specifically I didn't want to make that point until she read her poem. But it's so critical for people to understand that after the 19th Amendment was passed, August 26th, what happened was, you know, millions of women could not vote. So Blanche Ames, bless her soul, you know, she went on to birth control and other issues. And for People of color in Massachusetts or New Hampshire, those women could vote, but those in the South were still stymied and blocked by Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. So it's so tragic. And uh, what we found, what I found in my research, even the, the first states uh, that had uh, suffrage for women, and I'm thinking of uh, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, uh, some of the people who fought for it were African-American <laughs> suffragettes and some of them were from uh, New Bedford and uh, and uh, other parts of Massachusetts so the thing of it is you know the, it 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 there's a connection but um, the you know people fail to think to to realize that even though the bill was passed due to segregation millions were still disenfranchised yeah. you know i i want to have uh, each speaker to give a wrap up 30 seconds or less, just in terms of where do we go from here? Willie, let's start with you. Actually, Willie, we'll save you. Let, let me start first of all with Lynn. Um, just, uh, just give us a sense of where do we go from here based on the highs and the lows that we have discussed today and the realities in terms of this topic of, of bias, anti-racism, ethnic issues as well. Lynn Howard, what are your thoughts? Sure. Um, I have to agree with what Pat was just saying. I think we need to encourage um, everybody to gain confidence and realize the mistakes are, you know, when things happen. Um, I always try to include that in my courses at the beginning of the year, um, you know, with growth mindset and talking about other people's failures and how they, you know, were successful after many tries. So, you know, just encouraging and trying to gain that confidence. And as I mentioned earlier, I think it's lights and nights like tonight when we can have discussions and we can educate each other and work together that will help us to get those role models that people need and open the discussions and make us aware of our own personal biases and, you know, things like that. So, you know, I think just continuing these conversations, continuing to work together, it's going to be an ongoing process. I wish, you know, we could say it'd be over tomorrow, but we know it's not. It's been going on for a long time, but I think we just need to keep working on it and we'll get there and all of us, are so positive tonight. And I think, you know, we'll just keep sharing. Great. Great. Thank you so, so much. We do have a question that came in from Freddie K. Freddie K, go on and ask your question. Hi, thank you. Um, I actually just wanted to make a comment and build on what Willie had said in particular. Nice to see everyone. Um, 
For those who don't know me, my name is Freddie Kay, and I'm the founder and president of Suffrage 100 MA. And I want to build on what, what Willie said, and also the spectacular poem was just uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for doing that melody and for sharing it with us. Um, to let you know that because of the 100th that just went by and we couldn't do an event outside or with people together, long story short, we ended up making a movie. Mm -hmm. And for those who haven't seen it, I'll put it in the chat to go to Suffrage 100 MA. It's about 30, 35 minutes for those mm -hmm. who've seen it. It's actually going to be on TV this weekend at 830 on Sunday morning, and I'll put the information in the chat. But I wanted you to know that one of the things that we highlighted that was really important to us was that the story doesn't, first of all, it includes many African-American women through uh, the history that we try to relay in this short period of time with such a lot of history, but also continues after the 19th to talk about the issues that you were just mentioning in particular, Willie, and this evening about all the people who couldn't vote, even though the 19th Amendment had been adopted due to other laws and limitations that barriers that they faced and that needed to be overcome. Um, so I think you'll enjoy the movie. It includes um, Representative Presley, the governor, lieutenant governor, many elected officials, um, Elizabeth Warren and Mayor Spicer, telling the story, uh, but also some performances and some young people, many from the community from nearby, Katrina huff uh, who's our vice president, together we worked on this, and many of the community you might recognize. So that's at Suffrage 100 MA. Thank you so much. I appreciate the moment. Thank you very much. And Freddie's going to put the information in the chat in our Zoom chat room. And those of you who are on Zoom down at the bottom where it says type message here, if you have your eyes to go across, you'll see something that says file. <clears throat> and then you'll see three dots. This is if you are on a laptop or a desktop computer. Click on the three dots. I've just done it myself. And uh, up will pop save chat. So you can save all the information that is being shared in the chat room. So you can go, again, if you're on a laptop or a desktop, doesn't work if you're on a uh, tablet or on a smartphone. But if you are on a laptop or a desktop, you can save the chat. We're going to save Pat Monteith. And for the very end, I want to move on to Keith Connors. Give your final comments about where do we go from here. No, and I would say, I would say that we, as, as a state worker, uh, someone that work, work, has the privilege to work for the state of Massachusetts, is to stay engaged. Uh, each one of us, um, I think, has the responsibility to stay engaged with the process. If we want to eradicate racism, take someone along in your advocacy work. Um, uh, make sure your legislators know what's important to you, what your values are. Um, you know, we, we're being funded by a foundation, but but... Money, um, as anyone on this uh, on the Zoom call knows, if you're working as a teacher, you're working for your city, you're working for your state, um, comes and goes. Um, and so we really need advocates that um, that express that this work that we're all doing is, is important um, so that it can keep going. And that's what I would say. Awesome. Keith Connors, thank you so, so much. Dr. Thank Sabrina. You, absolutely. Dr. Sabrina, gentle warrior, your final thoughts. My life is easier every day because of white privilege and that I live in a white supremacist culture. That is not right, that is not appropriate, that is not just, that is not fair, and that is not the America we all want to live in. For anyone who has white privilege on this event, I ask you to join with me and I thank you for joining with me on committing every day to do at least one thing, perhaps many things, to end white supremacy. Our black and brown citizens, we know are dying. COVID magnified this. The news is magnifying this. The names that we have heard most recently, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, so many others. Those are just the most recent, and they're not going to be the last. This struggle is being lived in the lives and the deaths of our black and brown citizens. And the America that I envision, that you envision, that's not who we are. But it's going to mean that white people like me do more 
prioritize this, make this the overriding concern of our lives, just as it is for our black and brown citizens. America I want to live in will finally actualize liberty and justice for all, and we know we are not there yet. Thank you for doing anything and everything you can. Sabrina Gentlewater, thank, warrior, thank you very much for your prophetic and insightful comments. Thank you. We're going to bring uh, Chris uh, Jemian back on. And Chris, with your remarks, please give us information about how people can learn more about AAUW. Chris. Yes, Carol. They can go to the website aauw.org and find out about the um, educational uh, fellowships, find out about uh, ways to um, maybe gain some support, apply for some support to even change a, a career, to work, to try to study in the less representative fields, such as medicine and law and computing and, and engineering. Um, there are grants for that, um, but also to look at the long history of women's struggle represented by AUW. Um, unfortunately, as it, we saw with the suffrage movement, there was a split and women separated when they really should have bonded together and worked together and uh, gotten into the, into, the, um, into the battle together. Um, but we are here now today. We can't change the past, but we can't ignore it. We have to learn from it. We're here today. We're going to go forward, fight together, keep going, and try to offer as many opportunities for our young women and our young men, <laughs> so they're not forgotten, uh, and as we can. And uh, that's the goal of AUW, to advocate for uh, equity and, and um, opportunity. And that's right. where I'd leave you. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you for all the historical information that you shared with us earlier. Dr. Amina Pilgrim, your final thoughts. Thank you, Carol, and thank you everyone for such an amazing uh, evening. I'm gonna say, um, I'm gonna try to remember a quote by one of my favorite uh, sources of inspiration, Toni Morrison. And um, say I'm speaking this to Melody and to all all of us. Um, you are your own best thing, and I think that we should, you know, be confident. We should lift our voices. We should hold hope, and we should do um, as so many of you have said: just do whatever we can to contribute. Um, no, nothing is too small. And um, thank you. I'm grateful for everyone on this call. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. And Willie Wilson, final thoughts. Final thoughts. Wait a minute. You're on. I, I, thank you. I just want to say that uh, this working on this program uh, this whole year has just been um, uh, wonderful, exciting, exhilarating. Uh, of course, Pat Monteith talked me into it, and little did I know it was going to become a, an all-encompassing project. But I do want to say uh, I am so hopeful uh, for the young people. And uh, I, I, what uh, Sabrina said is so true. We, we have to, uh, um, we really have to bring along um, our children, our friends, uh, and, and to let them know this is uh, a number one objective to, to help play a part in making this country more equitable. And, uh, and it, starts, it starts with us, those of us who are stakeholders, whether we're teachers or uh, retired uh, mentors or mentees, whatever the situation. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, playing my role. And I do want to thank everyone for the participants, uh, all the participants in this program. And a shout out to uh, Evelyn DeLutis and Adrian Williams and all, everybody, Jen Belcher, very quiet. This is unlike her. Uh, but uh, um, it's just been a wonderful, wonderful journey. And uh, even though the 100th it ends, this project is one that has to continue. Uh, because it's just fraught with so much more fruit as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. And again, thank you very much, Melody Rivas, for that powerful and riveting poem. I would be remiss if I didn't ask Catherine Honey just to have maybe a couple of words to say before we turn it back to Pat Monteith. She has, I mean, she, she's like the producer and the director of this program. So Catherine, um, um, 
let, let's uh, have a word from you before we uh, turn it over. Catherine Honey. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thanks to all of the presenters and the uh, attendees. Uh, I think one of the things I'd like to focus on is that uh, COVID-19 has made us very aware of the importance of access to technology mm -hmm. and the importance of digital literacy skills for people of all ages. And if we want to provide equitable opportunities for success in school and in the workplace, we have to make sure everyone has those skills. Um, and as the coordinator for the Southeast Maps um, Network, um, I work with Keith and others uh, throughout the state to make sure um, those services to provide those opportunities are equitable. Um, I will, um, in the information I sent is information on STEM week, which is in October. And while we want to make sure people who are now interested in STEM continue, we want to increase the number of underrepresented groups who participate in STEM. So I would encourage you all to uh, go to the state website for Mass STEM Week and participate and contact me if you would like more information. Um, so we can make sure all students are prepared uh, to take care of the wonderful opportunities available in America. Awesome. Catherine, honey, thank you so much for all the work that you continue to do and what you taught me about 10 years ago. And here we are on this journey. Really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure for me to be your moderator or facilitator today. I am Carol Copeland Thomas, a diversity professional for some 33 years. In addition to that, I also have been teaching free Zoom tutorials, a couple each month. I put the link in the website. They're completely free. And it's zoombycarol.com. They're about an hour and a half sessions. We go right into all the nuts and bolts of Zoom. And I'd love to have you, wherever you happen to live, to join us. That's zoombycarol.com. Awesome. Pat Monteith, take it away. Thank you so much. I, you know, just Carol. <laughs> Thank you, well, Catherine. <laughs> one or two final comments. Um, and then, Jen, if you could put that survey back into the chat box one more time, um, we'd really like you to participate and take that survey. Um, but, Catherine, as you bring up the Mass STEM Week, um, you know, the theme this year is See Yourself in STEM. You know, and if people don't see anything but, you know, a white guy in a lab coat, then guess what? They don't think that STEM is for them. Mm -hmm. And you know, no matter who you are, and even if you're not a STEM person, you can play a role in helping these students, you know, see themselves in STEM. I mean, if you have to do a little bit of research of, you know, some of the STEM professionals, people of color to introduce students to, um, that would just be absolutely amazing. So please take a part in um, STEM week if you can, or any other time. The other thing that I really do want to emphasize is the importance of mentoring. Um, and I can't say that strong enough. Um, I know the students that I have mentored over the past, I can't count how many years, <laughs> I won't tell you how old I am, um, you know, have succeeded in ways that they, they didn't think was possible. And a lot of it does come down, as um, I think uh, Chris had mentioned or Lynn had mentioned, to confidence. And if you can play no other role with um, students um, but help them gain the confidence to gamble, to succeed, to you know try, and trying is really important. You saw the results of Melody trying. Absolutely amazing. If you saw the um, first place art winner in the suffrage contest that we have, it would just 
stop your heart, seriously. It was so incredible. Um, so please find some time to mentor students. It really does make a huge difference. Two, a uh, couple of quick things. Uh, right now at the uh, Brockton Library, as well as Brockton City Hall, we have um, a display uh, called Rightfully Yours, not Rightfully Hers, which is um, a, a native, a national archives exhibit. You should go over and take a look at it. That's really pretty great. Uh, coming up next month, uh, there's going to be a traveling exhibit by the American Bar Association on the 19th Amendment called 100 Years After the 19th Amendment, Their Legacy and Our Future. Those two will also be at the Brockton Library and Brockton City Hall. Coming up in a couple of weeks, Borderland, The Life and Times of Blanche Ames. If you have not seen that, this is a great time to do it because um, the, the uh, documentary's producer, Kevin Friend, uh, will be part of the conversation that night. And um, the one thing I really do want to emphasize, if you've got the time to participate, Thursday, October 8th, we did it for you. The Suffrage Story, Civil Rights, and Voting Today. It's a presentation with actresses told by the women who are there in a journey, starting with the struggles leading up to the basic rights for women with the focus on voting rights for women. That is going to be an absolutely phenomenal presentation. Again, that's Thursday, October 8th at our typical time of 6.30 p.m. Um, yes, Lynn, it is a great play. Um, thank you to everybody for participating. Carol, you've done a phenomenal job. Matter of fact, I don't think we've had a moderator on any of these who have been so organized um, and gotten those of us who are presenters in shape as well. So um, thank you. <laughs> um, and Jen did put the uh, Facebook page in there. Um, you know, we come out with a, a little bit of uh, information about what's coming up next. If you want to be on our um, mailing list, uh, you can go to the Facebook page and give us your information right there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Memorable. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good Thank night. You. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.